Normally on this channel, I like to make retro video game console mod tutorials, but I thought I'd try something different this week. I've got a couple of retro modding topics that I'd like to go over for the week of October 10th, 2021. First up, Chris2600 posted earlier this morning about a PS1 digital firmware release. I'm not really gonna talk about the firmware release itself, but somebody asked him on Twitter, when they expected to see restocks of the PS1 Digital. And Chris went on to say that it looks like it's not gonna be until quarter three, 2022. Anyone who's watching this video is probably aware of this thing called the coronavirus and the chip shortage because of that. But I think we're gonna be in for a pretty rough rest of this year and early next year, as far as getting some of these retro console mods that I know people want. In a few of my modding tutorial videos, I get people asking about availability because usually I upload the video and they can't even buy it because it's out of stock. And unfortunately, I don't think that's gonna end anytime soon. Leon here was even asking for Mike Chi to give him some contacts for some chips, but it sounds like Mike bought a bunch of parts in 2020. So just brace yourselves because we might be out of these mods for maybe a year or so. Next, I wanted to talk about Zek Fu's redesigned Game Boy Advance PCB. I learned about this from watching Bob from RetroRGB's weekly modding news video. In a nutshell, this is a redesigned Game Boy Advance PCB that actually is based on the Game Boy Advance SP CPU. I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail about this, but I do like a couple of things such as this USB-C port, which acts as a charger for a LiPo battery. So you can use a LiPo instead of AA batteries. And it looks like there's some redesigned power delivery and audio stuff. And it has tactile buttons that actually are featured on the Game Boy Advance SP. The reason I brought this up is because I think that these redesigned PCBs are gonna be really interesting and important in the future. We're starting to get to the point where some of these older consoles, probably something more like the Atari 2600 or the original NES, those consoles are gonna start getting harder to find or they're gonna be mostly damaged when you do find them on eBay. So having a project like this that I think is open source, but it's available to the public to get and put together themselves, I think that that's gonna be really important in the future. I haven't gotten around to them yet, but I have an Open Tendo and a Necessity board. These are replacement boards for the original NES. At least the Open Tendo is sort of a more vanilla recreation of the original board, but the Necessity actually has some additional features like a, a new power board over here, a redesigned AV output up here. Anyways, I think that these projects are really awesome and they're gonna be really important for us in the future. Now, I might get in trouble for this next story, but I think it's sort of interesting. I don't know a ton about the Paprium backstory other than it's a new Sega Gen Genesis game that is sort of having some difficulty being released to the public as far as people buying it and then actually getting carts and getting working carts. But that's not really what I want to talk about. Apparently that game has some sort of sophisticated protections that only allow you to play them on genuine Sega Genesis hardware. And it has additional chips inside of the cartridge that are required to have the game run. So recently I found this Project Little Man, which is a GitHub and larger sort of community focused on trying to dump the Paprium ROM. Now on one hand, I do believe that the publisher Watermelon Games has the right to restrict people from using this if they want to. As soon as people started getting their cartridges and they either didn't work on their real Sega Genesis's or they got them and they were broken or they were causing issues with their Genesis. I can't say I blame people for wanting to dump the ROM. I don't necessarily know if I support it. However, I think that it's interesting that they're trying to go after this ROM. Not only that, there's this Arcade Projects Twitter account. Every day almost, they post this absolutely savage stuff about them trying to break into this cartridge. A little bit over a week ago, they showed screenshots of them trying to remove the epoxy from the cartridge to see those other chips on the board. So I think it's kind of interesting the lengths that this project is going to try to get access to the ROM in this board. Okay, next I saw this post from Asm FPG. I think they're the dev that's trying to create a PS1 core for the Mister. They posted this video to Twitter this morning showing a seemingly working version of Spyro in a PS1 Mister core. Now to anybody who cares about the Mister project, you kind of right away know why this is exciting. I think that this is the first time that we've seen PlayStation 1 footage running from a mister, you know, there's no actual proof that this is running on a mister, but if it is, then, you know, this is really exciting. Now, it looks like they had to do some kind of a bypass because right now there's no CD loading or that part of the PS1 core isn't working. So they were able to load the game into sort of a safe state and then get that working in their PS1 Mr. Core. Either way, I think this is kind of coming soon, I hope, and that people will be able to get their hands on it and to show it off. And I think that that's 
extremely exciting for anybody who cares about Mr. Next, I want to do a couple of shout outs. I think that these people are really awesome. They're working really hard to help the community. Yeah, let's just take a look at some of their work. So first, I want to give a huge shout out to Jeff Chen. I love the passion coming from him. Almost every day he's got a new, I'll call it crazy, like VGA project, or in this case, this is a LED diffuser for the RetroTINK 5X Pro. Absolutely awesome. I think that this is really cool. And I, I wanna try this on my RetroTINK 5X, but apparently it's kind of difficult to get the case open. You have to use a bunch of different, po uh, you have to use a bunch of different points around the RetroTINK, as well as use guitar picks. Uh, kind of gives you flashbacks to like opening a Xbox 360 or something, but I definitely wanna give this project a try. Th I think that this adds a little bit of cool customization to a RetroTINK and just Jeff Chen is amazing. He has all these open source um, projects on Thingiverse and just follow him on Twitter. You'll know everything. Just follow him on Twitter. The next shout out that I want to do is to Fraggle Rock. Him and Zaxor have created a uh, SNES RGB bypass mod um, based off of Bordy's board. And I believe Voltar had some work in that as well. Uh, an SNES RGB mod is not anything necessarily new. However, this mod comes from Fraggle Rock as a kit. So you basically, you get the PCB and all the components to build one and it's sort of DIY, you put it together yourself. The only reason I'm recommending that is if you are interested in maybe learning how to solder surface mount parts. This board is basically nothing but surface mount parts. If you don't wanna put a SNES RGB mod together yourself, you should just buy the Voltar RGB mod. I mean, it's not that much more expensive and, and Voltar is awesome too. I think that you should support both of those guys. But the reason I think that Fraggles is cool is to get that extra bit of experience. It's not every day that you get to solder really small um, surface mount components. Now this last shout out is kind of a humble brag slash a sneak preview for a, a video that I'm going to be working on hopefully. A few weeks ago, I saw this post from Shank Mods on Twitter about this uh, Ashida or Ashida Wii portable mod. Now this picture here is a render of it, but I mean, come on. On. That is immediately amazing. It's essentially a hacked Wii inside of a custom shell with GameCube buttons. Now I'm not gonna give away too much of this project, you're just gonna have to subscribe and watch that video. But I will tell you that I've reached out to Spicer Labworks. They have an SLS 3D printer, which is selective laser sintering. This is a professional caliber 3D printer meant for like rapid prototyping for industrial work. But come on. Look at the detail on this print. I mean, I don't even see layer lines from this angle, maybe down here in the corner, but I think that this is just gonna be awesome. Hopefully you enjoy the video when it comes out because I think this product is awesome and I'm gonna try to show you guys more about it. Now, the last thing I'd like to talk about is sort of a retro community issue. I saw this post the other day from Voltar talking about the Ultra HDMI V2. He was mentioning the things that he liked about it compared to the N64 Digital, but then he started talking about the lack of documentation for this project. Now I was able to get an Ultra HDMI V2 and I created a video about it. You can check that up here. So I know exactly what Voltar is talking about. There is documentation available from the creator, Marshall, for the original version of the Ultra HDMI. However, there is a couple of changes between that version and this latest version that people can get, kind of. I can confirm that there's only a couple of screenshots in the group by thread that have details about the stuff that's different between version one and version two. Voltar was kind of upset that these guys that are running the group by didn't supply more documentation. At this point, I don't think we can expect Marshall to create his own, or at least he's kind of hard to contact. Anyways, Voltar brought up that really interesting question of, I guess, who's really responsible? The mod creator, Marshall? These guys running the group by? I'm not sure. That was one of the main reasons I wanted to create that Ultra HDMI video because there really isn't any other information out there. I'm not really trying to take that job away from anybody, but I just don't think it's fair for people to start getting these mods and not know how to install them. Anyways, let me know what you think about this topic or any of the other topics in the comments. If you wanna suggest a topic for me to talk about, you can always mention me on Twitter or even better would be to join my Discord server because we have plenty of people who like to scour the Twitter verse and the rest of the internet for interesting retro console modding news. I'll see you in the next video.